we have make a start. we have 15 people so i think we'll make a start on this and um welcome everyone to the code clinic um this is going to be our what third installment of a bit of getting and um this is going to be uh uh ben starting off he's going to take us through some continuous integration uh features of github and how it can interact with your git repository and then we'll talk about doing a pull request so we'll use some of the repositories we set up in the or some of the code we set up in the previous uh couple of code clinics and we'll show you how you can push <clears throat> Uh, changes between one person's repository and another person's repository. So that's the plan going forward. It's pretty informal. So raise questions. Um, let's have a discussion and have a good code clinic. Yeah, this will be recorded as well. So we'll um, distribute the video after. You'll have, you'll have a little bit of uh, banter between Jules and I at the start of video. So just, just skip through that. Right, so I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Hey, Patrice. Hi, Patrice. Hello. Hello. I'm late Hi, Patrice. and I'm gonna to have to go early. So uh, I don't know why I'm here, but uh, I wanted to provide some moral support. <laughs> Fantastic, Patrice. Yeah, so I'll be there just for 20 minutes or, or even less. Yeah, that's okay. So we're gonna start off with a bit of uh, continuous integration. So um, continuous integration is kind of a, a, a neat tool that's offered by GitHub and uh, GitLab and well, pretty much all of the Git repositories out there now. Essentially, it's really good for two things. The first thing is to run a series of unit tests to make sure that whatever you're um, committing to your repository isn't going to break functionality with the existing repository as it stands. The second is really to kind of, um, I guess, build for like an application workflows where you've got to build um, a release or a distribution and you need continuous integration to convert files and um, yeah, data to a correct format that um, people can actually take and use. Um, that's kind of uh, a bit of background, but what we're gonna do is do the, um, the first one that I mentioned, which is to make sure that we have some unit tests in our code to make sure we're not breaking existing functionality. So just a reminder, if you haven't already done so, this is Jules's GitHub um, page with the Git demonstration. So I'll just put this in the chat window in case if people haven't been. Around I can do that before. for you. You can do that? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, I'm just going to get the chat up here as well. We yes. So <clears throat> if you haven't already done so, um, you can clone Jules's repository, which um, you can do by pressing this big green button that says clone or download and you can just copy that link there and I've already done it but say if you haven't got this repository you can clone it to your um, uh, directory on your computer um, by just going git clone pasting in that address that you've copied from the big green button and then it'll clone um, to your current directory. <laughs> so I've already done that so I'm not going to run that command um, but yeah you can run that again just to bring yourself up to speed with where we're at today. So once you what, what, what you can also do is actually uh, fork the repository um, which is what a lot of people have done. If we look at all the available forks here, we're going to see that quite a few people have already forked the repository. So that basically creates a, 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 a copy of Jules's repository and puts it into your, your own repository space. So when you go fork, 
then it'll bring you to something like this, which is um, a, essentially a copy of Jules's repo, but you can see that now it's got BR Mather at the start there. So that means that it's, and it, and it tells you as well, it's forked from Jules's GitHub demo. So I can, I have um, free reign over this. I can make as many changes as I want. And that doesn't get um, interfere with Jules's copy of the repository. Unless if I want to do a, um, a merge, if I want to merge my changes back into his upstream repository, um, which we'll do later. But first, let's make a few changes to his repo um, that make it worthwhile merging back at the end of the day. So some of these, let's do some continuous integration. So with GitHub, we have uh, GitHub Actions, which is one of a family of continuous integrations. And it's nice because you just click this button here, actions, and now you're greeted with a series of workflows. I encourage you guys to follow along. And if you do, you'll probably see um, that there won't be any uh, workflows here at all. It'll just be a blank repo, uh, or blank, um, blank workflow. And what you can do is go new workflow, and it gives you a whole bunch of pre-built templates to integrate continuous integration with your repo. So because um, the world is uh, Python, is going Python, let's set up the Python workflow. So we just click this button and you're greeted with this page on the left here. So you can see Oh, sorry, Benny's just said that he wants the font size a bit larger. Um, yeah, maybe that's better. Can everyone see the uh, web page on the left? Is that okay? Yes, yes. Yep, cool. That's fine, yeah. Yeah. All right. So yeah, you're greeted with this, which is essentially a template <clears throat> for a uh, continuous integration workflow with Python. Um, and you know, it looks a bit uh, jargony. You've got like a whole bunch of text. So I'll just briefly outline what these all mean. So um, you, you give it a name, which is Python package and on uh, push refers to every time that you push something new to the repository on the master branch, or you create a pull request on the master branch, it'll run this script. And so you have some options here for what is what you're going to run the script on. So GitHub has a whole bunch of virtual computers that it runs your code on. Um, and in this case, uh, we've chosen Ubuntu latest, and it's going to test your code against all these different versions of Python. So 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, uh, which is great because you might see some depreci uh, deprecation warnings or uh, different um, different issues that might come to the forefront with different versions of Python. So it's good that they allow you to test with all these different versions. Um, and then you've got a whole bunch of steps here. So uh, for each one version of Python on this machine, it runs all these steps, which is uh, using pip to install, uh, well, yeah, to upgrade it st itself. It also installs Flake 8 and PyTest, which is uh, basically just um, a Python package for, for testing. Um, and then, yeah, it, it, uh, there's also uh, Flake 8 is a code linter, which isn't that important, but we can keep it there. Um, and then, yeah, test with PyTest. So it just runs PyTest to test all your, um, yeah, all your tests in your repository. So we can give this a, we can, we can actually just uh, commit this straight to our repo or we can change the name. So I've already got a Python package.yml in there because I've been testing it before. So I'm just gonna give mine a Python package 2.yml um, file name. And I'm gonna go start commit, create Python package 2 and then commit new file. Okay, and so it's put it in this directory here, which is uh, git demo, which is the top level directory of my repo. 
dot github and then under workflows so i can as, add as many workflows here as i like and um, github will just run through all of them okay so has everyone been able to do that or is everyone more sort of happy just following following me do we have any questions Nope. Cool. No. Oh, we got one. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, cool. All right. So, Pete Mass says it all works. That's great. All right. So, what I encourage you to do is uh, since we've added something on the, um, the repository on GitHub, um, those changes haven't been reflected in our repository locally on our computer. So if we go back into git demo here, uh, that, that directory here, and go git pull, then we should pull those changes from GitHub. And you can see here it's, it's added a new, a new file uh, to my local computer. <clears throat> okay, so if you haven't already, um, if you haven't already got one, make sure that you have a, a test folder because in there we're going to put some of our tests, which will be fun. So I've just defined a couple of tests up front um, and I'm going to open this with. Uh, I'm going to use a different text editor. Here we go. So here I've just defined a whole bunch of um, tests. Okay, so they're very simple and yours will be much more difficult or more elaborate. But um, here all I'm doing is I'm testing addition, the addition of two numbers and then if uh, you know, five plus two, two equals seven, then it's passed that test. Uh, or subtraction, five minus two equals three. If that is true, then it passed that test. So what that actually looks like um, is I can run PyTest on my local repo and it's run uh, all the test scripts in my test directory and it's found, you know, all these different ones, and it's said that it's passed them all, which is great. So does everyone kind of see how this, um, yeah, this, this, this kind of can be useful for, for their own workflows? Like you can, instead of having simple arithmetic operations, like we've got here, you can have much more complex unit tests where you might test for something like, um, yeah, uh, plate velocities uh, over, over, over time. You know, you might have a test here that's looking at the velocity over time and making sure that the velocity doesn't get above a certain scalar value. Um, or you might have uh, something to do with underworld where you might be testing to make sure that a simple Rayleigh Taylor benchmark uh, passes it each time you run it or each time you make a new commit to the code. Um, and so they can be really useful if you've stuff, stuff something out um, because then GitHub will tell you. So I might just make um, a small change here. Uh, yeah, what am I going to do? I'm just going to delete this test. I don't want this test anymore. It's, it's too annoying. So I'm going to delete that. I'm going to save this file. So I just save that then, close it. And if I go git status back in my repo, it can tell me that I've modified that file, test arith arithmetic. Um, so if I go git add tests, test arithmetic, 
get status has got a change to be committed. So what I can do is go git um, commit, and then I'll write a little message, which is remove uh, pi test. Okay, and then to upload that to the GitHub repo, I can just go git push. And then now it's um, synchronized to the GitHub repo. So if I just refresh my page here, um, and I go under commits, we can see that I've got this, um, this latest commit here is remove PyTest. So our, our repos are in sync, which is great. You'll also notice that there's a little yellow status symbol here. Now what that's telling me is that it's actually running those tests. So I can click on that and you can see that it's got a whole bunch of pending yellow lights. And when eventually uh, all of these virtual machines run, they'll turn into green ticks to say that all tests have passed and we can sleep easy at night. I can also go into the actions um, tab on GitHub and this will show me all of the different tests that I've run in the past. And it shows me that all of the tests that um, I've implemented have currently all passed, which is great. So let's make an example where something is going to where, where a test is going to fail. Um, firstly, do we have any more comments or, or questions so far? Has everyone been able to perhaps write their own test or see how they can write their own tests? I've got a bit of a, uh, did you know this? Um, go, which go for which, it. You, which <laughs> you probably do. Um, the virtual machines you can test on, Ben specified it was going to be Ubuntu latest, um, which, is, which is great, but you can actually go back a few versions of Ubuntu. And you can also test on Windows machines and on Mac machines. So it lets you do some, you know, platform testing uh, which is really useful and might be, you know, very useful for for things like G plates or or any application anyone's building that they want to make sure works on many platforms. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, we can actually. So maybe for my uh, Python package two tests, maybe I'll change this. I'm going to just edit that file here using the online um, editor. Um, <clears throat> what was the, it was just Mac OS X, wasn't it? Was that it? Latest? It's Mac OS dash latest. Ah, yeah. And let's just say, I don't need to repeat these tests all on all these different versions. I'm just going to run it on 3.5 or th sorry, 3.6. I'm going to commit these changes. So this is going to run all these tests on Mac OS. So um, I'm just going to create a descriptive commit message, which is going to be run Python tests on Mac OS. Cool. So I think there are some limits to how long the tests can be run for particularly on the free uh, versions of GitHub. So, you know, those are the, the ones that uh, Jules and I are using for this demo. But Sydney Uni has an enterprise agreement with GitHub, which I think gives you uh, not unlimited minutes of um, uh, testing time on, on GitHub's computers, but in practice, pretty much unlimited time. So you can run lots and lots of tests for every commit, which is good. So since I've done that commit, it's also run all the tests again, and it's telling me that all the tests have passed. Now I'm going to make an example where one of the tests is going to fail. So I'm going to go back into that, sorry, back into that um, .github workflows 
folder and I'm going to click on uh, the testing suite again. I'm going to make an edit. And it's given me all these different Python versions. I'm going to add Python 2.7 to the mix. Now, really, that shouldn't actually break anything, but I have in advance made a test. Uh, sorry, made, yeah, made a, a, um, a unit test that behaves differently from Python 2 to Python 3. So I'm going to just commit this change. Um, add Python 2 test. Okay, so I go back to the top level directory, I click on commits, you're going to see all these are running. Um, yes, if I go on actions, tests, oh, this is the, uh, the Mac one. So we're, we're just testing on Python 3.6 on a Mac. We can see all the step-by-step, -step, um, I guess, workflows that it's, it, it's running in real time. So you can actually see it running on the testing computer um, in real time. And so it's, uh, it's ticked, which is great. Um, go back into actions. Okay, so we have a failed test. And sure enough, it's on Python 2.7. Oh, actually, this isn't due to the, the problem that I wanted it to be with. Hmm. Okay. Um, whoops. Okay. The reason that I wanted it to, to fail is because um, division has actually changed between Python 2 and Python 3 in that um, if you have, it, what, yeah, what is it? If you're having, in, in Python 2, if you're dividing a floating point number by uh, any number, then it returns a float. But if you're returning, um, if you're, yeah, if you're evaluating, it, yeah, if you're dividing a integer by a, a floating point number, then due to typecasting, it's going to return an integer. So if you have numbers that don't round off um, to, to zero, then you're going to run in a, into a problem where, uh, yeah, you're going to be rounding to the nearest integer. So to kind of demonstrate that, I can open up a terminal, go Python 3, and if I go 3 divided by um, 5, 0 0.6. Okay, and if I go Python 2, 3 divided by 5, it goes 0. So, yeah, it, it seems kind of daft, but that, that, that is one of the changes from Python 2 to Python 3. <laughs> um, yeah, so what I might do is because no one, it, Python 2 was deprecated at the end of last year. I'm actually going to go back and remove that test um, because we don't care too much about it anymore. So I'm going to go back here, edit this file, remove the Python 2.7. And I'm going to say, actually, don't worry. Let's stick to Python 3. So can I just add to that? Um, is that is that supposing because we used uh, Ubuntu latest, and Ubuntu latest probably drops um, Python two seven by default with pip? Yeah, I think on their virtual machine that's true. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. so this is actually the perfect use case for continuous integration. It's when you make a change wanting to affect something, but you break something completely different. And that's what you did. <laughs> exactly. So, um, 
So I'm pretty happy with that. If I go back into my repo, I can see that the tests are running again. And because I've changed it back to its initial state, then they should all pass, which they have. Okay, now that is some quality um, value adding to Julian's repo. And you can tell by his uh, profile picture how eager he is to have these changes back into his repository. So what we might do is actually create a pull request, which essentially uh, merges all of my changes that I've made uh, back upstream to Jules's repo. So the best way to do that is to hit on pull request. And we're gonna go a new pull request. Okay, so we can see a list of all my changes and it says, oops, can't automatically merge. Okay, so that's because there's a conflict. So not only do we have a pull request, but we have a conflict. And so we have to do conflict resolution, which is super exciting. So yeah, you can see all of my changes here. Um, yeah, Julian's initial version is somewhere all the way down there. Um, and we can see file by file exactly what has changed, which is great. So, you know, all these pluses in the green indicate um, new text that I've added to um, different files or, or indeed new, new files that I've added. <clears throat> and these are, yeah. And so where you've got the red, you've got a minus, which indicates that that's, that, that's been deleted. And this is probably where the conflict has occurred because we've got the same uh, yeah, different things happening on the same line. So, yes. Anyway, let's create the pull request. Big green button. Merge changes to Jules uh, GitHub. Create pull request. Okay, and you can see here that it's got um, it's, it's found the conflict and the conflicting file is the readme.md. So what we can do is resolve conflicts. And it's shown me exactly where, yeah, the, the line that it's occurred on. And you know what? I think what I'd like to do is just um, use uh, Jules's original um, yeah, original text that he's got here, which is, uh, where is it? Yeah, well, yeah, I don't actually know which one's the best one to choose here. Um, Cause I don't think, I don't think we actually got around to using the binder example very extensively. So what I might just do is use my uh, versions copy. So I'm just going to do this. And so the change that I'm proposing to this file is to override Jules's um, uh, modifications and um, submit my own change as the one to rule them all. Okay, so Julian uh, has just commented, what is the definition of a conflict and when does it happen? So great question. Um, a conflict generally occurs when two lines of the same file have been edited or modified um, by two different people. So normally GitHub can kind of merge the changes seamlessly if you're merging different parts of the files that don't seem to affect each other. But um, yeah, if it's on the same line, then it'll say that it can't automatically merge those changes and that it needs some manual inter intervention to uh, squash, squash that change. Uh, Jules, do you have any, anything to add about um, conflicts? You, you would experience that much more than me. Yeah, yeah. No, you've got it exactly right. Conflicts are, um, um, yeah. Conflicts are when you have uh, the same line has different edits by different people. And so when you're trying to merge those two changes together, 
the there there are dis different systems to do merge complex resolutions. So Sabin points out is it sensitive to the limited spaces and tabs? And I don't know the answer off the top of my head because there are different um, uh, merging tools available and you can get merges for most editors. I know Vim has a merging tool, um, Atom does, all these other um, IDEs. So it depends on the specific IDEs implementation and you can get them configured so they, they you know, take care of spaces or delimiters or things like that. So you can, you can set it up pretty extensively. Um, yeah, and in this case, the reason why there was a conflict was because when Ben initially forked my repository, that was at a stage um, where Ben forked the repository and then made changes. But I also made changes to my repository independently of Ben. So we had these two evolutions of, of the repository. And then as Ben tried to merge back, that's when the conflict occurred because at that merge back, it realized that these two changes were occurring on the same line by two different authors on two different change sets, raising this merge conflict. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna mark this as resolved because I'm happy with what I've done here. I've uh, essentially gotten rid of <laughs> Jules's and uh, Jules's uh, version of the changes. And I'm just going to suggest my changes as the ones to, um, to accept into the upstream repo. So I'm gonna mark as resolved, commit merge. Yep, that's fine. Okay. So, but what happens if Julian does not agree with your with you changing, um, or like the way you resolve the conflict? I'm glad you asked, Sarah, because this is where we hand over to Jules to see what uh, Jules has got on his screen and whether he's going to accept all of my changes or not. The drama. The drama. <laughs> Cool, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, so yeah, I've kind of done everything that I've, I can do. Um, so over to Jules now to decide whether to accept my changes or not. So, yep. Nice work. Nice work. So I'm going to now share my, um, my screen. Find it. Uh, okay, so can everyone see this, my GitHub repository? Yes. Yes. Yes, excellent. Okay, D is there any further questions or should I just go on straight from there with, with what Sarah raised? Oh, I'll continue on. Okay, so um, first off, what do I see? There's this little bell icon um, at the top of GitHub in the browser and that bell icon is your notifications. And if you click on that, you will see all these notifications um, that have occurred across every repository you're watching, every person you're watching, account you're watching on GitHub and all those kinds of things. So it can be overwhelming, but you see at the top of this, um, this, this board is a picture of Ben and his merge changes to Jules G Hub. So that's a way you can see notifications. Usually you also get an email too that's associated with GitHub. So that's another way you'll find out about it if you get a pull request. But let's go back to the repository itself. Um, 
the real indication that there was a pull request is because this little tab has got a one next to it, pull requests. So we'll click on that. And sure enough, we see um, that there's one pull request open, which is by Ben, which was made eight minutes ago. So that's Ben's pull request. And so I can click on this and I essentially get the same view that Ben was showing us, which is the collection of all the changes, all the commits that he's put down. Um, and at the, where is it, where is it? Yeah, we see a lot of his commits and I can make a comment here and say to Ben like, hmm. Uh, let me think about it. And we can send that to Ben. And in the meantime, we can investigate Ben's changes. So we can look at what is this add flake lint in here? I might want to look at this commit. And sure enough, I can see, oh, right. At some stage, he added this piece of code to this file here. And in that way, I can go back and see all the changes that, that Ben made because I have access to this, this pull request now. I should say that just now I've got an email notification from uh, GitHub saying that Jules has commented on my uh, pull request. <laughs> so you should be able to comment down here too. Yes. So can you tell me to hurry up? <laughs> or something like that. Right, so, so the real cool thing is that at the bottom of this, um, this pull request, I have this big button in green, which says I can, I can merge this um, pull request in, in a few different ways. And these all mean various, you know, thing, um, strategies for how to merge a pull request and how to really take care of the history of Ben's changes with the history of my changes and how to make that, um, um, uh, uh, you know, how to set that up differently. And I can also you not use GitHub to do the, the merging, but I can follow the command line, which GitHub also tells you about. So if I were to go back to the, um, to pull the code down onto my local machine, I could follow these guidelines to set up um, the code to merge into, for, for Ben's pull request to be introduced to my repository as a branch. And then I could merge that branch with my master branch and therefore merge my repository locally and then push my repository up. So I've, I've done a comment, so maybe you just have to refresh. Um, but, Refreshing. Uh, yeah, on my, on my screen, uh, it says that only those with right access to the repository can merge pull requests. So of course, this, this kind of pull request um, workflow uh, is still possible if, you, if you're working amongst people um, who have right access to the same repository. Uh, it just gives people a chance or an opportunity to comment on people's work uh, in a nice interactive way. So speaking of that, I'm going to go into the readme file where Ben got rid of my binder link and put his link. And what I can do is review his changes and I could write back to him. No, I want as my link, something like that. I can also request changes, and this again will will if I if I hit submit review, then that review will notify Ben as an email that he has someone commenting on this file on this change and we can start a collaboration on the file like that.
So, um, I I think this is good to commit. We know that Ben now has this button URL for binder pointing to his repository and not mine, but I'm going to accept that. I can change that later. And what I'm going to do is merge his pull request. So let's see what that looks like. Go back. Hurry up. Back, merge into Jules G Hub. So I'm gonna hit this big green button that says squash bins changes and merge them into my code. And that squashing takes all of Ben's previous commits, all of the messages he wrote and just squashes them all into one big commit. And that commit is gonna be the message I see when I merge it across. Boom. So now Jules G Hub merged this commit into Jules G Hub master. So this button has gone from green to purple, which indicate and it says merged. So that means I've merged it across. And now if I go back to my repository and look through the files, we'll see that it's got all of Ben's extra stuff, including the test directory, the workflows directory, and they all took place in this change, which was made 30 seconds ago, which was Ben's pull request. And just for kicks, I'm going to change that file, that, um, that binder URL, because I want to point into Jules G Hub, not BR Mesa. Tab. And then I'll make a commit there on my master branch. So this is now we can look at the commits that all took place. And we can see that in the history from my point of view. Um, there was all these changes that I made, Jules G Hub, the author. And then a minute ago, there's this change made by Ben. And that was the squashing. So we've squashed all of Ben's changes into this one change commit. And that's been applied to my repository. And then I made this one commit on top where I changed that URL. So that's, that's the power of, of merging and merging with GitHub. It, it makes it all fairly straightforward. You can see the diffs, um, you can see every commit and you can also comment and collaborate and get notified um, pretty easily through the system. It's also, um, you can see from Jules's commit history that <clears throat> since he, um, accepted the changes that I made. He's got little green ticks in his commits, which means that the continuous integration is now included on his repository. So now he has continuous integration. That's right. It's very cool. So are there any questions about that? So Benny raises the question, what if you agree with only a part of the changes, not all of them? So um, that's where you can, you know, use the, 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 the commenting section to tell, I would have told Ben in this case, like, I don't agree with your changes. Can you please fix them up? That was that I didn't actually run through it, but that's what I kind of previewed. I could run through. I, you, there's a there's a little uh, subsystem within uh, a pull request where you can nominate uh, reviewers of a of of changes and uh, those 
reviewers have to okay changes um, to allow it to allow commits to go through. So I could easily say to Ben, nah, your pull request, I'm not gonna leave it there until you change the URL. Here's the URL I want you to change, the part I want you to change. And then I could just say to Ben, you know, change it. And when you do, I'll, I'll accept it. But if you don't change it, I won't accept it. And the, the pull request will remain in sort of purgatory until then it's, it's code that someone can act on. And I myself could pull down the code, uh, Ben's pull request and make those changes myself and then do whatever I wanted with them. I hope that answers your question, Benny. Yes. Thank you. So maybe in the remaining minutes that we have, um, we could just quickly demonstrate um, uh, the GitHub projects functionality. Um, yeah, we've kind of, we've talked a lot about uh, pull requests and the kind of collaborative tools that are available on GitHub, at least, you know, for, for its core user functionality, which is, uh, yeah, like accepting changes, reviewing changes, um, there's also kind of another step out from that, which is projects, uh, where you can kind of organize things from a much higher level perspective across multiple repositories. So, um, Jules, do you want to do this or, or I can, I can do it. Hang on. Maybe I'll, I'll just share my screen. Yeah. If you want to go for it. Um, Yes. Okay. That is my comment. Mm -hmm. um, so if people aren't already aware, there is a Sydney University GitHub page, uh, which I'm just going to... Wait, is this the right one? Yeah, I think so. Earthbite. Here we go. Yeah, this is the enterprise, uh, ent uh, Sydney University's yes. enterprise version of GitHub. Yeah, that's right. So what I might do is just put this um, in the comments for people to go to. So if you have a um, UCID login credential, which everyone should, then you should be able to access this page. Um, yeah, there's already a whole bunch of um, repositories here um, and we've got some people, but not everyone in the Earthbyte group uh, currently in there. There's, there's Michael, there's Daniel. Um, I haven't included my profile picture yet, but I can do that later. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have yeah, a whole, whole bunch of different repos and there's varying degrees of activity. Um, yeah, some are looking like they haven't had much activity in quite some time. <laughs> um, but there's others that are quite, quite active. Um, you'll notice there's a the little projects tab there. Um, what we can do is set up a project. So say, let's, let's call this project uh, plate reconstructions. Um, yeah, for every realm involved in plate models. And I can assign a template, um, which I don't know, let's, let's do a, a, an automated Kanban. So there's a basic Kanban, which is your standard, you know, uh, to-do list, uh, in-progress list, and complete list. Um, <clears throat> but then you have this automated Kanban with reviews which essentially is triggered every time there's a, uh, an issue uh, ticket on one of the repositories or, um, or a, a new pull request. Uh, so that auto automatically goes into the to-do column. So we can, we can go for that um, and create project. Yeah, and here we go. So we've got our to-do list, 
where we might want to say, I don't know, um, make a revision to the AREPS model, which never happens. It, it's, it's totally a, a wild card to do request. <laughs> um, but we'll add it there anyway. Uh, and then, you know, um, oops. Uh, we can make edits to this. No, we can add, I think, um, a, a list, list item one, list item two. Yeah, and we can drag it into in progress or review in progress. Um, or if it's looks like it needs to be more in progress, we can drag it back again. Um, so yeah, I don't think I need to talk too much about Kanban boards because people know how it kind of works, but the point is GitHub has these uh, inbuilt tools um, to help manage uh, yeah, uh, repositories and projects. And as we can see, Sabin's just added uh, something in progress, which is, this is so great. So thank you, Sabin. I think it's also great. And I'm gonna approve, put that in the reviewer approved column. Okay. Um, oh yes, the bins just uh, commented in the comments. So yes, I think that I'm not exactly sure what the public versus private means in this case. I think private is just everyone uh, that's on the earth by its user list. So that's uh, all these people here. That's all the private people. And public is probably opening it up to the rest of you, Sid. I don't know if you can include um, people external to the UCID GitHub enterprise at this stage. Okay, Sarah asks related to actions. Uh, I guess it's just easier if I just say it. Um, so related to action, could that functionality that you showed for the tests be used between different versions of Badlands, for example? Or like different versions of Underworld? Yeah, absolutely. So Underworld have done this quite, um, have leapt on this bandwagon quite heavily, I think. Um, and maybe Jules could comment more on that, but um, yeah, exactly. Like uh, Underworld testing, uh, Under Underworld has a whole bunch of unit tests to make sure that, um, yeah, uh, certain um, certain code snippets work as they're supposed to. Um, yeah, and I th I'm not sure uh, what Badlands is doing with continuous integration, but it is certainly possible that, um, yeah, uh, either Tristan could set up some scripts um, to test for Badlands functionality, or perhaps end users could set up some scripts to test that their um, models, like a, a, I guess a kind of stripped down version of their models can be reproduced on different versions of Python or, or what have you. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, from a user point of view, um, you know, like I don't, don't develop any parts of the code, but it would be nice to see, for example, how different, like if the results are similar to, um, regardless of the version that I'm using. So I guess that that's that would be something that I'm interested in, for example. Oh, so like the version of Badlands, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so definitely, yeah. Um, I think for Badlands, there's like a quite a extensive history of different revisions. So you might have, you know, Badlands version 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. And what you can do is set up a, 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 an actions workflow that essentially pulls each different version of Badlands and tests it against your scripts to see if they if they all make sense and they they agree. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. That's really cool. 
It, it, yeah, um, I can expand on that a bit from the underworld kind of side of things. We've been using that for a while and we don't use GitHub Actions. We use something called Jenkins, which is another server, but essentially it does the same thing. Every time there's a, a commit made to the repository, the Jenkins server goes away, runs the code in various different configurations and tests it. And um, they're it's really cool having that technology like that really makes it powerful stuff and then the the issue becomes designing the tests and you know designing tests that are, are meaningful to what you're looking at so um yeah we've, i've i'm happy to talk more about that you know um at a later stage because that's a that's a very fertile ground for like model development and also checking if your models work with one version of the code to the other. Thanks. Cool. Well, I think that's taken us to lunch. So, uh, yeah, unless if there's any other burning questions. Um, yeah, I reckon we can, we can say thanks for joining this code clinic. Thanks for hosting. Thank you, guys. Very informative, as always. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Cool. All right. See you later, then. Yeah. Have a good Wednesday, everyone. Ciao. Yeah. Oh.